Hey, welcome. Um, we're very excited to have Abhay Pasopathy with us here today. Um, he did his PhD at Cornell and then moved to a postdoc uh, in the US Downey lab at Princeton, um, which he completed in 2008. Um, and since 2009, he's been a professor in the physics department at Columbia University, and he's currently also a group leader at Brookhaven National Lab. Um, he's most well known for his work on 2D materials and scanning tiling microscopy. Um, but I believe that today he'll be talking about um, two very new and different experiments. Um, so with that, let's welcome. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, thank you for having me. It's not too far. Um, so I should say I'm, I'm going to break one of the what I was told is a cardinal rule of giving a colloquium, which is one should never talk about uh, unpublished work at a colloquium because a colloquium is supposed to be things that everybody can understand. So I'm going to break that rule. Uh, I'm going to talk only about unpublished work. So none of this work is published. But the reason I want to tell you is it's something that's exciting to me uh, quite recently in the last couple of years. <coughs> And I hope I can at least convey to you uh, why I am excited, even if the talk is very disorganized, shamefully disorganized. Uh, for which I blame that this is the middle of the semester and everybody is shamefully organized. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about two new experiments. And I'm going to be fairly honest about how it is that I got into these experiments. Uh, I got into these experiments because of jealousy. And I'll try to explain that as well. Okay, so uh, the two experiments, so one of them has a rather large group of collaborators, but the star person there is a postdoc slash research scientist, uh, his name is Mark Ziffer, and the other experiment is a grad student of mine and a postdoc who is shared between me and my two colleagues, Jim Shuck and Jimmy Chukas. Um, very good. Okay, so let me straight away get into how I got into these experiments. And as I said, jealousy was my motivation. Okay. So this was me uh, until a couple of years ago. And this I was what I would call a traditional condensed matter physicist. So what does a traditional condensed matter physicist do? That is what I do. Is you take some solid, which has some interesting property, it's a superconductor. And uh, you try to figure out, you try to make some story uh, for why this solid behaves the way it does. Okay, so that was the next matter of things. And then there was this new world, which is called quantum information science. This new world has many things that I can recognize. Here is a dilution fridge. That's something that even I know how to use. When I was a grad student, I, I used this. But then the language that these people were talking about was like an alien thing to me. You were talking about Hamilton, Hamiltonians and unitary operations. Of course, I know these things, but then they were talking about it in a context that was completely different from anything that I knew. And uh, as we know, a lot of uh, funding these days goes towards that direction. And so I was like, man, I'm going to be shut out of this if I just keep doing this stuff. So I better learn about what this stuff is. So that's where I started. Oh, okay. Okay, so. Then I started to ask myself, what is this quantum thing? And people poo pooed my superconductor. But my superconductor was as quantum as anything that anybody did. Right? We use quantum mechanics on a daily basis. I never heard of a classical solid in my life. <laughs> it was quantum. And we make stories in, in what my previous life, even now most of my life, we rationalize how quantum mechanics works to understand the properties. So then I started asking myself, what is this new quantum? What is this quantum information science? And the best thing I could come up with was by uh, an example, which is, of course, the simplest quantum system, which is a two-level system. So you have some system where there's two possible quantum states. And uh, what I understood out of this new quantum is that somehow it is key that you can control the evolution of the state of one particle that lives in this two-level system at will. <clears throat> And typically, this is done uh, with a photon, for example. Uh, so the key aspect that distinguishes this new quantum from my old quantum is that I need to be able to control this quantum state somehow. And if I do that, then I magically enter the realm of the new quantum. And uh, this thing, if you can do this, you can do many different things. I think a lot of you here already worked in this, so I need not say much about it. 
And one particular thing, which is what I have been doing with, with this kind of stuff, is what's called quantum sensing. So with quantum sensing, the idea is that you can use this uh, coherent evolution of the quantum state to somehow say something about a system of interest. Okay. So if I can measure, for example, uh, magnetic field, which is what I'm going to tell you about in this talk, with very high precision using some sensor that is based on coherent evolution, that would be a quantum sensor. Uh, so please stop me at any point. Okay, so um, then you can ask what is sort of the simplest quantum system uh, that does this sort of stuff. And of course, this we all know is a spin one half, uh, spin one half. Uh, for example, uh, is seen for every proton, something we know very well. Um, and uh, one sort of very famous application of this, this is perhaps one of the oldest quantum sensors, I don't quite know if it's the oldest, but certainly one of the old ones, is nuclear magnetic resonance. So you apply some magnetic field, you split the uh, energy levels of the spin one half, and uh, this magnitude of the splitting depends on the magnetic field. And so if you put this proton in different magnetic fields, it can sense the magnetic field. And NMR, MRI is all based on this thing. So then I started looking and saying, okay, I'm going to do this quantum sensing. I'm going to do something in quantum. What should be my platform? What should be my quantum thing? And I can see that there's sort of three platforms that people use these days uh, in this quantum field. One is cold atomic gases. These are actually the most exquisite sensor because the atom has sort of the best defined energy level. Some atoms are, have beautifully precise energy levels. Uh, but these things are terrible when you try to combine them with solids. You bring an atom close to a solid, it wants to stick to the solid, it wants to do all sorts of things. Uh, and so it's been a real struggle, I think, in this cold atom community <coughs> to use them as quantum sensors of solids. They can be quantum sensors of other things like primordial uh, electric dipoles or things like that, but not solids as far as I know. Uh, another platform here, Javad and many other people here are working on this, is a superconductor. Right? So a superconductor is this amazing object which you can describe with this one uh, quantum variable. And this thing, actually, there are many existing quantum sensors already built from superconductors. This creates uh, current sensors. Um, so, and then there is a third category, which is the one that, to me, seemed to be the most suited to doing the kind of quantum sensing that could be useful for me. And this is defects in semiconductors or insulators. And uh, the idea is that this defect <clears throat> that lives in a semiconductor or in an insulator, you can imagine the semiconductor or the insulator to be like a vacuum, and then this defect is like an artificial atom, and this artificial atom has some energy levels, and you use the energy level structure of this atom in much the same way that you would use the energy level structure of a real atom, these are intrigue atoms. And these things have the great advantage that these atoms are all stuck in place. And so these things are perhaps much easier to use if you want to use it as a quantum sensor for some property of interest of a solid. Okay. So this is this is the thing that I started working with. And one can ask, okay, if I have such a quantum sensor, what would be an interesting problem that a person like me who is interested in condensed matter <coughs> really want to do with such a quantum sensor? And I want to give you just two examples of this. So uh, this is an example called uh, a heavy fermion, um, called heavy fermion or heavy fermion phase diagram. So uh, there's a whole class of materials where you have moments, so these are magnetic moments that live on a lattice, and these magnetic moments that live on a lattice can be in one of two states. One is they can be magnetically ordered like this, or if you change some control parameter, so this can be doping or this can be pressure, then they go to a different state where instead of being magnetic, they form a singlet state with, with other electrons and they go to what's called a heavy Fermi liquid. And in this heavy Fermi liquid, it behaves like the fermions have a very heavy mass. The details are not super important, 
uh, all I want to say is that this is sort of a well-established class of materials. And the way that people, a standard way, if, if uh, you're a condensed matter experimentalist, to study such things is to measure the resistance of these samples at different points on the phase diagram as you lower temperature. And what you would notice is as I get close to this critical point that separates the antiferromagnet and the heavy Fermi liquid, the resistivity changes from something that looks like this red curve to something that looks like this black curve. Okay. And you would measure data like this, and then you'd make up an elaborate story about what's going on about quantum criticality. Okay. And we, we are very good at this. We are very, very good at this. And I think we are mostly even right. But if you ask me, this is a very bullshit way of doing things. Right? You want to tell something about these spins, but you're measuring resistivity, which is not very simply related to it. And you're making up a very elaborate story. What one would love to see is really the spins here being an antiferromagnet, the spins here being in a singlet state. And here, this is supposed to be this wonderful fluctuating region where the spins don't know what to do. And they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So one would like to see that. Here's another example. This is a, a, a state of matter called a spin liquid. And the idea of the spin liquid is that I have spins on a lattice, and the spins on the lattice are frustrated in, in the sense that they don't know whether to talk to this spin or whether to talk to that spin. And as a consequence of this frustration, what ends up happening is instead of ordering magnetically and forming a magnet at low temperature, they're just fluctuating all the time due to quantum mechanics. So for some time, this spin is, is talking to this guy, it's in a singlet state with this guy, then for some time it's in a singlet state with that guy, and it's just fluctuating all the time. And this is sort of one of these states of matter that people, people love, theorists love to talk about these things. They make fantastic theories about all these things. And if you ask how do people measure these things right now, <clears throat> so this is inelastic neutron scattering. So details again are unimportant. Inelastic neutron scattering tells you something about excitations in the system. So it's not directly telling you about what these spins are doing, which way they're pointing, or about the magnetism. It's telling you about the excitation energy of excitations in the system. And they look at these excitations, and uh, they compare them to some theory, and then they say, ah, oh, it looks like a spin liquid. Right? Again, I would say, ah, oh, come on. Right? There could be a hundred different reasons why the excitation spectrum could look like this. It could be disorder, there could be all sorts of things. I want to see those fluctuating spins. That's another thing, another motivation. For I should say that I have achieved neither of these things, but this is a guiding principle. Okay, so now let me get to the experiment where that I have done, which is the first step I would say along this path. And this is a much more mundane and much more boring experiment, but I think already it tells us something interesting. And in this experiment, what we're doing is we're studying a fairly classic ferromagnet. A ferromagnet is this material where all the spins point in the same direction. This is the particular ferromagnet we are studying. This is called chromium sulfur bromine. It's pretty popular at Colombia. Many people studying this. And uh, this material has the interesting property that it can be cleaved. So it can, you can use scotch tape and you can peel off layers of this. And if I peel off one layer of this, all the uh, magnetic moments point to the right. The second layer that's below it has all the moments point to the left. The third layer, all the moments point to the right, and so on. So if I have an odd number of layers, so if I have one, three, five, seven, nine layers, there's going to be a net ferromagnetic <coughs> moment pointing in one of the two directions. And if I have an even number of layers, it compensates and there's no. And this is a. Uh, uh, you know, pretty plain vanilla in terms of magnetization. That's the magnetization as a function of temperature. And around 130, 135 Kelvin, uh, it hits its uh, nil temperature, or Curie temperature, if you want to think of one layer. And uh, then above that temperature, it's a paramagnet. So above that temperature, this spins up. <laughs> the sensor that we're going to employ is a uh, very famous sensor in, in, in quantum sensing, it's called so-called NB sensor in diamond. And I'm going to say nothing at all about this sensor, because I'm scared you'll ask me questions about it. <laughs> I don't know all that much about it. So the NB sensor consists of a nitrogen and a vacancy right next to each other. And there's a lot of details of the photophysics of this NB sensor that I'm just going to completely ignore. And say, at the end of the day, 
when you apply a small magnetic field, it's called a bias field, this thing behaves effectively like a spin half system. And uh, uh, it has two levels, and these two levels, you can drive uh, Rabi oscillations between them by applying some microwave field, which is in the gigahertz range. Um, I should say, in fairness, that this NV center has been developed over 20 years or so. And 10 years ago, to imagine that you would start along this path and make this experiment work would be very, very difficult. But these days, thanks to the work done by many, many different people, it's kind of become easy enough that a lot of things about the sensor are known, and a new person can sort of get into this and make one of these. So uh, in practice, how do we actually make the experiment work? Uh, we get a diamond crystal, which is shockingly expensive, and then you implant uh, the nitrogen into the diamond at a particular depth. In our case, the depth is around 30 to 40 nanometers below the surface. And there's a whole bunch of tricks which we learned from uh, Natalie de Leon at Princeton, who's really an expert in preparing these diamond surfaces. And we learned a lot about NV itself from Carlos Mireles, who's at City College. So they really helped us uh, make this happen. At the end of the day, what you have is you have an ensemble of these sensors, so they are randomly spaced inside your diamond crystal, about 10 to 20 nanometers away from each other in the crystal, so they're reasonably uh, concentrated. And the whole thing goes into an uh, optical cryostat that looks like this, not particularly impressive looking, but it does take quite a bit of doing. I would never have done it myself, but Mark knows his way around a laser, and so Mark built this whole thing up. Uh, over the course of a year and a half or so. Okay, um, how do you, um, what can you do with this thing? So the simplest thing that you can do, as I uh, already told you earlier, is this is effectively a spin half system, and the spin half system is sensitive to the presence of a magnetic field. And, and this is, this kind of tells you how the resonance frequency in this case, the, the resonance frequency between the two states that are active in the NV, how that energy difference changes as a function of magnetic field. And so with this, it's possible to measure uh, micro Tesla scale magnetic fields to sort of create sensitivity. And uh, the state of the art is sort of rapidly improving. I'm just going to show you one particular example. This came from, uh, I think this is, Patrick Malatinsky's group, although I'm not 100% sure. What they have is they have a fantastic system where they have a scanning tip, and in that scanning tip is embedded a single one of these NV centers. And this NV center can actually raster over the surface, so you get spatial resolution simply by rastering. You know where the NV is located because you know where your tip is. And using this, they can measure the magnetization Look here, this, the length scale is 100 nanometers. So they're doing really nice length scale imaging of the magnetic moment in some sample. This sample is, I believe, chromium triiodide, which is twisted. So there's some uh, magnetic texture in this particular compound. Okay. Very good. So what we are going to do is we are first going to use this on our sample of interest. So this is chromium sulfur bromide. I use a picture of the sample. This is a sample that is exactly three layers thick. We know that very well from many other measurements. And uh, the sample looks like this. It's just exfoliated by scotch tape onto this diamond crystal. And it's, it's sort of a couple of microns this way and about 10 microns. In that One of the very nice things about chromium sulfur bromide is it also has photoluminescence. So if you shine a laser at it, it gives out light. And so you can use this in your microscope to really say what the sample looks like. So this is the light coming out from this sample. And then what we do is we do this uh, magnetic resonance measurement, and we measure the magnetic field that is coming from this three-layer sample. And, and it, what you see is you see uh, in the middle of the flake that there is no magnetic field. And on the edge of the flake here, there is a positive magnetic field, and on this edge of the flake, there is a negative magnetic field. And we can be quantitative about it. We can say that the magnetic field is some tens of microtesla. 
if you think a little bit and ask yourself what kind of magnetization gives you this kind of magnetic field, this is a question for all of you in your first uh, ENM class, magnetostatics, you'll realize that it's a, a magnetization that points like this and is constant in space. Right? So if the magnetization points like this, it's like a bar magnet, that's a wrong bar magnet, it's very really long that way, and short this way, the magnetic field is going to loop around like this, and if I have a sensor that's below it, this is precisely what I'm going to see. And you can use this picture to, with the magnetization of chromium sulfur bromide that is known, and ask yourself what kind of magnetic field I expect from this. And this is our simulation, and you can see even the numbers, everything sort of lines up with each other. All of this sort of makes sense. Very good. So this is a sort of step one, we can measure small magnetic fields with the sensor. Then what we can do is we can raise the temperature and go through the magnetic transition temperature. And as we go through the magnetic transition temperature, no surprise, the magnetization goes away. So this is close to the magnetic transition temperature, you see the, the magnetic field gets smaller, and then eventually above the magnetic transition. So this by itself is no surprise, this is sort of known from other measurements. Uh, what we then set out to do is to see if we can measure magnetic fluctuations, not just the magnetization, near the phase transition. And let me go through that pretty quickly. So uh, let's go back to um, how we think about these kinds of phase transitions. The way we think about these phase transitions is if you're at high temperature, the free energy of the system is such that it prefers to sit with zero magnetization. And as you start to enter the magnetic state, the free energy of the system develops a minimum at non-zero magnetization. And as a function of temperature, it sort of evolves from this guy to that guy, and then to this sort of Mexican hat like thing. So this is something that all of you know about. And if you now ask yourself, when you're in either the normal state or the magnetic state, what do the fluctuations of magnetism look like? You can get a very simple picture of this just by considering what a ball would look like in this kind of potential surface. If I'm in the magnetic state, then this thing can oscillate. So that is some kind of magnon mode. And this has some particular frequency associated with the curvature of this particular surface. And similarly, if I'm in the paramagnetic state, there is also some, some uh, frequency associated with it. Now, as you come close to the phase transition, uh, these fluctuations become slow, and that's typically associated with any phase transition. And since I'm here, I have to mention the book where you can read all about it and learn everything that you seem to know. So this is just a little simulation for the easing model, but this is sort of very well known uh, now in statistical physics that as you approach the phase transition, two things happen. One is that the, the fluctuations become slower and slower, we call this critical slowing down, and you also have bigger and bigger sort of puddles of fluctuations as you approach this phase transition. And so we asked ourselves, can we see that now in our three-layer sample? That would be pretty nice. So how would one see this if one has a bulk sample? So here is, uh, these are very old measurements. These are beautiful measurements. This is from uh, neutron scattering. And in neutron scattering, you see precisely this as you start to approach the phase transition. This is the fluctuation spectrum. And you see this fluctuation spectrum shift towards zero frequency. So it goes towards zero frequency and you see this thing broaden. You can do this as a function of momentum and different momentum transfers and done all about the noise spectrum and noise. But if you have a you know, thin sample like this, you cannot do neutron scattering on it, and you cannot do many of the other bulk probes. So this is where now we can use the, the magnetic resonance properties of the uh, NB center to study this. And in MRI, there's sort of well-defined ways to do this. Uh, so there are, you can look at uh, population decay, so you can put the spin in one particular state, and uh, if there's energy transfer between the spin and its environment, this will cause a loss of the population. This is called T1. And the one that we are interested in is called T2. T2 tells you uh, about the decoherence rate. And, and, and there's a, many different ways to measure it. One of them is called spin echo, which is what we do. 
Okay. Um, so uh, a little bit more of the details of how you do this. You start from a well-defined state. You sort of flip the state over into superposition. You allow that state to evolve for some time. And if the state is evolving under a constant magnetic field, then it will precess. But it precesses to a well-defined point, and you can always recover its own initial state by applying an appropriate pulse. But if there's random magnetic noise, then each one of my NVs is going kind of going to go in a different place. And if I try to bring it back to the original state, I'm not going to do that with 100% fidelity. And by measuring this as a function of time, you can tell what the coherence as a function of time is. And I'm sure all of this is familiar to a large number of you, and I apologize if it is. Okay, so what do we do? We do this kind of spin echo measurement uh, in chromium sulfur bromide as we approach this phase transition. So what you see here is this is the coherence as a function of time, time here is in microseconds, and this is done for different temperatures as I approach the phase transition. And as a first cut, what you can do is you can just fit this decay to a simple exponential, and you can extract out a coherence rate. A rate at which decoherence happens, and you can study how this decoherence rate changes as a function of temperature. And indeed, you beautifully see that as you approach the phase transition, so this is the magnetization of the sample, which starts to dive around the phase transition. As you hit this phase transition and you measure the decoherence rate, the decoherence rate really spikes. And this is quite wonderful, I would say, because the NV is not a particularly fast sensor. And so you're measuring electronic things with this NV. So you really have to be close to that phase transition to measure things that are many microseconds in, in time scale for, for solids. Okay. Um, now, at this point, we know that there's more fluctuations close to the quantum critical point, not quantum critical point, thermal critical point. Um, but these fluctuations could simply be because there's puddles that are located at different points in space. This does not necessarily say something about the dynamics of fluctuations, how fast these things are fluctuating. But how could we say something about this? Let me first give you an intuitive picture for this. So let's say we look at the uh, how coherence is lost at very short times. A good picture for what's happening in our magnet is that I have puddles, the puddles all have different magnetic moments, they're all pointed in different directions, and my NV center, which is sitting somewhere, is seeing some net effect of all of these puddles, so it has some net magnetic field, and it's processing under this net magnetic field. However, if I wait for long enough time, and this time is the correlation time for these puddles to exist, after that correlation time, these puddles are all growing and shrinking, and so if I come after a long time, there's no relationship between the size of these puddles and what they were at time t equals zero. And so at long time, the spins that the, the sorry, the magnetic field that the NB sees looks like a random magnetic field, uh, and the NB sort of takes a random walk in these magnetic fields. And there's a beautiful paper done by NB uh, a couple of years ago. No, only last year. <coughs> where she studied this for a different system. It was not a, a, a solid magnet like this, but it was intrinsic spins that exist in, in the diamond itself. And what Emily showed is that if you look very carefully at how this coherence dies as a function of temperature, and uh, you study this on, in, in plotted the appropriate way, so you have to take some logs and so on, then you can distinguish the early time behavior and the late time behavior from each other. They have different slopes. And the crossover happens uh, where this coherence time happens. And so if you really want to see the slowing down of the fluctuations, what you want to look at is you want to look at the data plotted in this particular way. And you want to look at this coherence time, or sorry, this correlation time, and see how it changes as you get close to the phase transition. And it turns out you have to take much better data than this. And Mark basically killed himself taking this data, but he did. And you can see very beautifully, you can see this in the sample, you can see that the early time behavior and the late time behavior have two different slopes. There's details of that, which I believe uh, are still un understood and need to understand further. But one thing that's very clear from data like this is if you study this, this uh, correlation time and you plot it 
as a function of temperature, you really see this correlation time change as your cold state phase transition. And so this was really a, a nice demonstration of this critical slowing down close to the phase transition. It's only a classical phase transition. We know these things should happen, but still it's very nice that you can do this with this kind of sensor. Uh, I'm going to skip over this other than to say one can actually use this to figure out what the critical exponent is associated with the phase transition. And uh, Mark finds that it's somewhere between the 2D XY and the teasing model for this particular. Piece. Sorry, what was on the x-axis in the previous slide for this bottom plot? Like, what is, what's, the, what's the x axis here? Yeah, this one? Yeah. This is, the, this is just the time. So this is basically uh, a replotting of this data for this time here. So oh, you, you're going to take the coherence. This is the coherence. You're going to take the log of that, and that gives you this, this phi. Then you're going to plot it as a function of time on a log scale. This way. Is this a single layer, or, or is it a 2D magnet? Yeah, so this is three. This is a tri-layer, but mm -hmm. only one of the three layers has an uncompensated moment. Mm -hmm. So it should be the same for a single layer. It turns out the single layer is a little more chemically sensitive than the tri-layer. And that's the reason we prefer to work with tri layers. So, but it would work the same way. <laughs> OK, so uh, let, me, let me say, OK, now that we've done this, some of the things that we are now working towards, so these are things that perhaps are more intellectually interesting. One of the things I'm very interested in is orbital magnetism. So we know that in solids, uh, there's, there's two reasons for which you can have magnetism. One is the spin of the electron, and one is the actual motion of the electron. And this orbital magnetism is what's responsible, for example, uh, is something that happens in quantum Hall states. For example. And one would like to study this orbital magnetism using this kind of NV center. This is something that we're in the process of doing. And the other thing is something I already introduced to you. One would like to study phase transitions that are not thermal in nature, but quantum in nature, close to t equals zero. That's the other thing that we love. OK, how am I doing on time? I want to make sure that. 435. 435. Oh, so I have like another 20 minutes. So, OK, I'll see. <laughs> All right, so that was experiment number one. Now I'm going to shift over to experiment number two. Experiment number two has some relationship to experiment number one. So let me try to make that argument for why it is related to experiment number one. So one of the things when you deal with these kinds of sensors like the NV or others, other sensors of this type is it turns out the material really matters a lot. Right? For those of us who are solid state physicists, this is no surprise. Right? This is the hypothetical NV. The real NV has all kinds of stuff around it because even this diamond has defects, it has surfaces, it has all kinds of things. And many people have spent many years trying to figure out how to optimize diamond. But if you look at what people do, what people do is they may polish the diamond or they, do, they may do stuff and then they study the diamond. But how did they study the diamond? They study it with optics. And the optics is sort of intrinsically limited to the optical spot, the diffraction limit of optics. Right? And one can, of course, improve on this. So one can, one can use other probes. So one can use TEM to get atomic resolution imaging of materials. But the TEM does not tell you whether the defect that you see is going to affect your NV center or not. Right? So there is some real need to have probes that can really deliver light down to a small length scale and probe optically what's going on at small length scales. Um, in, so this has also been going on for about 15 or 20 years. There's a very uh, nice field of nano optics, which is now uh, many people working in this, where people have managed to do this in a variety of different ways. So here's one particular implementation. This is from the lab of Dimitri Balsov and other people like him. Um, so in, in this implementation, what, they, what you do is you shine light from far away. So the line, light is illuminating some large area of your sample, diffraction limit of figure. And you bring some sharp metallic tip close to your sample. And you know that when you bring the tip close to the sample, you can think about this problem uh, like this. You can think about the tip as a little sphere of metal. This sphere is going to have an image charge if your sample is a metal. And so the electric field under your tip is going to be highly enhanced. 
And so this is a way of enhancing the field under your tip. And if, for example, you shake your tip at some particular frequency and you monitor the light that's coming out at that particular frequency, that's a way of telling what is coming from this part of the sample versus all the rest of the sample. Right? So people have gotten very clever about figuring out how to measure the optical properties of the sample from spots that are much, much smaller than the diffraction limit. Let me give you a second motivation for why we're doing the experiment that we're doing. And this, this motivation is unrelated to the MV center, but I think it's interesting. So let me go through this. So if you consider the field of light matter interaction, so these are all for the traditional optical solid state physicists, what you do is you shine light at a sample, the light interacts with electrons, and then it comes out, it would come out at the same frequency, it would come out at a different frequency. And if you consider um, what's going on in this in this process, then the photon, of course, cares. The photon is the one that you're measuring. The photon is interacting with the sample, and you're measuring the interactive photon that has come out. The electrons are, for a very minuscule amount of time, some electrons are affected by these photons. But for the most part, the electrons are like, ah, eh, whatever. Right? The photon came, the photon went, made no difference to my life. In recent past, so this is the last 10, 20 years, People have devised a number of experiments where the electrons also really care about the presence of photons. And let me give you two examples of this. Uh, one example is when you can really blast this solid with a lot of photons. So you really have a huge number of photons, so just the number of interactions is large. You can have all kinds of interesting nonlinear effects and so on. And the other thing which is similar is you use the photons to physically drive some motion in the solid. For example, you drive a phonon mode of the solid, and you really fundamentally change the solid in some way. And I'm going to give just one example, and then I'll, I'll skip over the rest of this, this part. So here is, a, is a, here is a beautiful experiment that one of my colleagues, Xiaoyang Zhu, in chemistry did. So what he did is he took two layers, tungsten diselenide and moly diselenide, and each one of them is a semiconductor, it's just a monolayer semiconductor. And if you shine light at this thing, you create electron hole pairs, if the, if, the, if, the, if the laser has enough energy to create these electron hole pairs. And the way the band diagram of this system works, all of the holes go in the top layer, all of, all of the electrons go in the bottom layer. Now, if I shine a small amount of light at this sample, I create a small number of excitons. But it is possible to shine so much light at this sample that basically you create so many electrons and holes in the sample that you can have approximately 0.1 electrons per unit cell and 0.1 holes per unit cell when you're shining a laser at this time. Right? And that is an insane number, right? That's what we normally associate with doping of a crystal, right? So if you, if, you, if you do solid state physics and you think about doping, 10% doping is a huge amount of doping. And so simply by shining light at the sample, you can create a 10% dope crystal. And I said, wow, wouldn't it be wonderful if we have some methods to study this kind of photo dope crystal where you can dope it by these large amounts? Okay, so uh, I've given you a lot of motivation and uh, what do I want to say here? Uh, what I want to say is, is the following. If you want to go beyond this, so if you want to do experiments that are beyond photon in and photon out, there do exist experiments where you can look at photon in and then you look at the electronic response. So here is a famous experiment. This is time resolved R pairs. So here you're looking at the response of the electronic system when you're driving it with photons. Uh, this is time resolved TEM. You're shining. Uh, laser and you're looking at a very short time scale at electron diffraction through the sample, these experiments are tough. So my hat goes off to the people who did these things. These are not things you want to do on a Friday afternoon and it's, it's just very difficult to do. So I'm a cheap guy and so we need to do something quick, we cannot wait for so long. And so here's what we did. So what we did is we took an optical fiber and we tapered this optical fiber and we shine light through this optical fiber and at the same time we put a little coating of metal on the side of this optical fiber 
and this metal allows us to do STM. And so what we can do by this is we can have a little teeny weeny light source that comes out from our tip with an insane electric field because we can pump a lot of light into this thing. And at the same time, I can look at the electronic properties because the STM is good at telling me what electronic properties. I don't think I need to tell any, anybody about STM. Let's skip over STM. So this, as an idea, is, is also, I would say, not new, not new at all. Uh, people, so this is Klaus Kern, who has infinite amounts of money. What they do is they put lenses that come close to the tip, and they do this just brute force. They bring a lens that's close to the tip and try to collect light and shine light at the sample. This thing is very difficult to do. It's very difficult to focus anything when you have these lenses all funky like this. Uh, our technique, actually, I should give credit where credit is due. This goes back to all the way to the 80s, where people who first did this technique that they called Ensemble, they first invented this in, in the mid 80s. And in the mid 90s, people did quite a bit on this of getting light out from, from tips. And unfortunately, at the time, everything was sort of hard enough, computers were hard enough doing the lasers was hard enough and everything was sort of hard enough that they, they did this on silicon, they realized that silicon doesn't really care if you shine light at it or not and then they shut their shop and then they moved on. So we decided to revisit this and so what we did is we built this probe, so here's our tapered optical fiber, here is a gold coating on it and here it is in action, so here is this probe, here's a light coming out from this probe, this is a reflection of the probe in the sample and so the light in the probe was sort of co-located with it. And we can measure this too. And here's a few more pictures. Uh, there it is, that's, that's in a probe. The probe goes in a microscope, fairly standard microscope. And so this is something that one student in over the course of a year can build. It's, it's not completely trivial, but it's also not. So we then needed a sample to study, and we were going to do this as a test sample, but this turned out to already be interesting. And what this sample is, is a dirty secret. It's a dirty secret for anybody who does scotch tape based 2D materials. So when you do scotch tape based 2D materials, you use scotch tape and you peel off a layer, and in the paper that you send off to Prisdev Letters, there's a picture of this layer which is beautiful <laughs> and flat. Most of the time what ends up happening is that this 2D layer sticks to the substrate in most places and in some places it forms these little bubbles. What's in those bubbles? Nobody knows. And we have a name for them, they're called nanobubbles. And so what we're going to do is we're going to study these nanobubbles because they have a natural small size which is good for testing out our instrument. And uh, Tom gave me, told me that the size of these bubbles is typically the size of a Kobe virus. Now I need to tell you which particular material we chose for our experiment and I need to tell you just a little bit, not too much about this material. This material is tungsten diselenide and all you need to know about this material is it's a semiconductor. The semiconductor, it has a gap, this gap is a direct gap and uh, that's pretty much all that you need to know. And People are very fond of this, people who do optics are extremely fond of this because it has a very strong photoluminescence and that photoluminescence has a very well-defined energy. So this is the photoluminescence from one layer of this tungsten diselenide and there's a whole industry of people who, who study this. All right, so here's our sample and what do we do? We go down with our new microscope, just like that and we stick our STM tip on this bubble, one of these bubbles, and we're going to play various fun games with it that I'm going to show you. So one is we can just use STM, and this is just to show you that this works like a good STM. You can get atomic resolution imaging and all that other stuff. 
We can also do spectroscopy, just you can do like you can do with an STM. In spectroscopy, you measure the excitations of your system. This is a semiconductor, so it has a conduction band, it has a valence band, you can measure both of these also. And just to put them side by side, this is the band gap of the semiconductor, this is the band diagram, and here is the band gap that is this way. Okay, so item number one that you can do that is fun is when you're doing the spectrum, you're applying different voltages to your tip. And at the same time, you can see is any light coming out from my sample. And indeed, hey presto, we find out that light is coming out from the sample. And light comes out exactly when the bias of your tip matches the valence band. So what is happening here is that the STM tip is injecting holes into the valence band. This turns out to be an N-doped semiconductor, so the chemical potential is close to the conduction band. So there's some electrons sitting in the conduction band. There's holes you're injecting into the valence band. These can recombine and give you light. And so we can measure the light that comes out. We have this interesting bias dependence that we are still figuring out. And we learned then much to our dismay that this was achieved just the previous year in this paper in a different geometry thing, but our results are the same as the results. But we can do more than what those guys did. We can go to this bubble and we can ask ourselves, where on this bubble does the light come out? Right? That's not something you can do with a far field measurement. And just to show you that we can really see that the light on this bubble comes out from around the edge of the bubble. Not quite sure why, so there's some hypothesis that this is due to strain around the edge of the bubble, but still to be determined. But this is just very cool because you can get an optical resolution that is a few nanometers in size by doing this. We can then do a different measurement. Instead of measuring the light that the tip is emitting, we can keep the tip at zero bias, so no light is being emitted, and we can just turn the laser on that we're sending to the fiber. And when the laser turns on, the laser is going to excite the material, and it is also going to cause photoluminescence, like I told you before. And we can measure that photoluminescence at every point in space. And once again, here, there's sort of fantastic resolution. So here you see the photoluminescence, and it has very nice resolution. It's only limited by the size of the bubble. Now, something very interesting, again, we haven't figured out, is if you look at the photoluminescence, it's actually maximized in the middle of the bubble. If you look at the electroluminescence, it's maximized at the edge of the bubble. Don't know why, but this is also. Sorry, no. So the wavelengths are still exactly the same thing that is well known. Yeah, so the wavelengths actually. Uh, the detector is collecting at that. Yeah, level. so in these measurements, this is an APD, so you're integrating over wavelength. Mm -hmm. We actually just now have spectra. So we bought a spectrometer and we can look at it spectrally. And there are some differences, and it depends on power and all sorts of things. So that's the kind of yes. a whole story there. Is there a dependence on bias? Or are you just at the threshold? Yeah, yeah. Or? So you can see, for example, a stark shift. As you apply a bias, you're going to have a stark shift on the excitons. Mm -hmm. That's going to give you a stark shift in the. Yeah, so we see. Okay, now here is the thing that is really cool. So what we do now is we measure the STM spectrum. The black curve is a curve measured with any laser turned on. And now I turn on my laser, I put in a small amount of power, 20 microwatts to the, to the fiber. I measure the same spectrum again, and you see that now this is the conduction band, looks exactly the same as before. I look at the valence band, and it looks like the valence band has jumped up by almost a factor of two. You ask yourself, what does this mean? Uh, so let's uh, remember some of our solid state physics. <coughs> in two dimensions, if I have a semiconductor, the density of states is a constant in two dimensions. And the density of states is proportional to the effective mass. So if I take this at face value, this says I turn my laser on and I change the effective mass of my band by a factor of two by turning on the laser. Now we can say, well, why not pump up some a little more power? Why not see if we can do this a little more? And indeed, it's quite amazing. You can see that you can tune this by over an order of magnitude. You can change the electronic structure of a semiconductor by on a laser. This blew my mind. And you can see that at high power, I can really shift the band gap by half a volt. So if you can somehow make this into a device, a little teeny transistor where you turn the laser on and off, you can beat the famous uh, 
Boltzmann threshold, you know, the 60 millivolt, blah, 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 all that will not hold for this because it's fundamentally different. It works by a different way. And let me say that we see many interesting effects in this. So, for example, you can see the edge of this shifting out to higher energy. That's a phenomenon called Pauli blocking. So when you start to fill up states near the edge of the gap, those are not available for tunneling anymore. So they block the tunneling current, it's probably blocking. And then uh, for the actual enhancement of the, of the mass that happens, uh, we have a theory that this is what's called Floquet engineering. That is when you have uh, the light, the light can basically dress these states and cause a flattening of the band giving you uh, higher electric mass. But I should say that uh, I wouldn't, I'm kind of skeptical to say this in public because nobody's ever done Floquet engineering with CW light. So this is just continuous light. It's always done with a very high power laser. And so this is still you know, something. Finally, I want to bring it back to the NV center to show you that there's a point of meeting. Um, if you have a defect in the tungsten diselenide, I can go to that defect and I can look at the electroluminescence. So this is the light that comes out when the STM is injecting carriers. And since STM is intrinsically atomically resolved as a probe, the light that comes out is also intrinsically atomically resolved. So I can tell you what light is coming out from exactly this defect with atomic resolution. And that's fantastic. Right? So this is something we'd like to sort of also push uh, in the future. And uh, let me just say that there, you know, there are many interesting directions. One can also think of adding dynamics into this, so having time resolved measurements with light, seeing how excitons diffuse, for example, would be something cool to do. All sorts of interesting things one can do. And uh, we are also working towards sort of the single photon regime uh, by integrating some single photon detectors. So that's all I had to say. I hope I didn't go too long. And thank you. So this cryostat, I guess, is needed just to go to the phase transition and temperatures. It's not really needed for, I guess, detection and things like that. No. So all the detection is at room temperature. So it's 2 Kelvin to 12 Kelvin? The, that optical microscope cryostat is only probably 4 Kelvin. But uh, there you can buy one that go down to, I think, I mean, Yakobi is building something that goes down to milli Kelvin. Is that right, Emily? I think so. But that requires a bigger budget. And the single photon, why do you need it? Just um, look at yeah, so we have this crazy idea that, you know, there, there are these, these uh, plasma uh, things that Dimitri studies. And I could ask the question, if I launch a plasmon from here, right, and uh, then I collect the light that's coming out from here, is this light going to be coherent with the light that uh, got launched from there. Experiment at a right. single point. So, yeah, so you could do this by other ways. So, G2, you could do G2 measurement. But, so. Yeah, so thank you for your very beautiful talk. So, I'm interested in this, uh, uh, like, change in the, the, the balance band induced by the CW laser excitation. So, do you remind us the wavelengths which you use? Is it above the band gap or below yeah, the band so gap? Yeah, so it's just above the band gap, very band close gap. to the band gap. Mm -hmm. We did try uh, a super continuum, so we went sort of above and below a little bit, but we don't have a good laser, so <laughs> I, I stole it from somebody and that thing was funky. And so we did see some, effect. certainly it dies off as you go below the band gap, mm -hmm. but one would like to see the expected behavior as you go close to the edge. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just didn't have enough sort of calibration on that to do that measurement very carefully. Something on the list of things. I have a good radar, but well, anyway, so. <laughs> You're my friend now. <laughs> <laughs> but another question is that, uh, is there no change at all in the conduction band? I ex expected some photocarrier generation. Ah, so this is a good question. Yeah. So in STM, there mm -hmm. is a, a, not a dirty secret, but all we can measure is the way the STM works is you say, bring my tip close to the sample and give me a certain current, mm -hmm. right? So if the overall density of states changes by some factor x, mm -hmm. then what will happen is that your tip will just adjust its height to keep the current constant. 
And so all I can say is that the ratio of the conduction to the valence band changes by a factor of 10. But is it possible that the conduction band is also changing by some factor at the same time? That is indeed possible. Mm -hmm. But we would not be sensitive to that because of the way we are still in So then I'll follow up with it with a question about dynamics. So if I, is it possible to turn the, to, to watch the, uh, the changes turn on and turn off uh, with the laser uh, so that you can measure, for example, carrier diffusion? Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. So there's some, you know, with the fibers that we use right now, there's going to be a small amount of issue because it's going to propagate through the fiber. But I think opticians know how to take care of that to, to make sure that. So that has been, because the question then is, 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 uh, is the mass that you get out for the carrier the same mass in, in the dynamical measurement? At yeah, yeah. So this is something, again, this requires a nicer laser than what we have right now. Uh, I didn't realize that lasers are so expensive. It's just I don't understand why. <laughs> it is expensive. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it should be something that we would like to do. So the bubbles are weird places in these materials. Uh -huh. Um, there are no nonlinear processes that lead to heating, and if there are, does the heating not matter? Yeah, so indeed there is heating. So whenever you turn the laser on, for example, the bubble might expand, and certainly your tip itself, which has a gold coating on it, some of that light is absorbed, so it's going to heat up. And so what happens is, as soon as you change the power of the laser, there are all kinds of drifts that happen. So what we do is, between each measurement, we sort of wait, we watch that drift, that drift sort of dies down over some period and then it becomes stable and after several hours we take the next measure. So that's how we avoid that issue. I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, this is just my curiosity, but is there any change if you use a circularly polarized light and then if there is some kind of very degrees of freedom plays a role in this tungsten uh, satellite families like so it's interesting do you have any ideas on it yeah yeah so very good question so uh, our first instinct was that uh, no because the tip really scrambles the polarization because this tip wants the electric oh, field to yes. be doing bad things but it turns out that it actually does not completely kill the polarization so we have a recent measurement on some quantum dots where we can see polarization sensitivity to right circularly and left circularly polarized light. So it does scramble the polarization somewhat, but I think it still preserves to some extent the polarization of the light. And, and so, yes, I do think so. Uh, valley, yes, so you ought to be able to see valley selectivity in more systems. This would give you some spatial sensitivity yeah. mm -hmm. and all sorts of things. Yeah, lots of fun things to do. Uh, maybe we'll stay a while more time. Thanks. Uh,